Kevin, is that you? Um, well, uh, thank you all for, well, thank you all for staying in this evening, I suppose is the obvious thing to do as well. Um, this, I'm going to talk about the Harwell Decatron computer. This has become a huge story, actually. And the more, uh, as time goes on, we know more and more about the machine. So I'm going to limit the bit of my story really to its early days, um, its construction, why it, was, why it was built in the first place, why it ended up in Wolverhampton, and then subsequently how it's actually been uh, installed and restored at the National Museum of Computing. Now, the picture that you can see on the slide at the bottom, it's a, sort of, it's a fairly arty picture, but we have something with a bit more detail later on. So I need to take you back to the immediate post-World War II period. We had shared a lot of our knowledge uh, and people um, across to the States, to the Manhattan Project, uh, to the development of the atomic bomb. But we had an arrangement with Roosevelt and Churchill, that uh, between Roosevelt and Churchill, that we would share all that technology afterwards. So when uh, at the end of the war, people would come back to the UK and to Europe with that knowledge. Sadly, Truman, by this stage at the end of the war, uh, Truman's in power in the US, actually here, and the Americans lost the agreement. They also put together a particular act to stop any of that information being shared. So England was fairly sort of cut adrift, um, but there was a determination. Ernest Bevin uh, attended a meeting over in the States and got fairly short shrift from them and came back and apparently banged the table in a, um, in a cabinet meeting to say, we have to have this thing here with a bloody Union Jack flying on top of it. So in 47, it was finally announced that actually we would start our own atomic energy uh, research. And in fact, it wasn't until May that the actual pro program was being discussed in parliament. So the first job was to set up a research centre in the UK. John Cockroft was asked um, to be the director of the Atomic Energy Research Establishment. So John would rather have had the uh, research centre over in Cambridge, Cambridge Academic, but the RAF, who had suitable bases, wouldn't give up anything in that far in the east of the country. But they would be happy to give up RAF Harwell, just south of Oxford. Um, <clears throat> Harwell was suitable, it was relatively flat, um, had got a lot of accommodation, or, uh, which they would need, and hangars and, uh, and buildings to start building the research centres, building the laboratories and so on. It didn't always go absolutely to, um, to plan. Um, I quite like this picture. This is a ventilation chimney above one of the first reactors that they built at Harwell. Um, not for smoke, it blasted five and a half tons of cold air up through the reactor and up through the chimney. Terrific, easy design and so on. When they first started to test it, they realized they'd built the biggest organ pipe in Europe. And you could hear this thing, this sonorous sort of boom about 30, 30 miles away. 
So it wasn't, it didn't always go to plan. There were lots of stories from those days. You can see the, um, the construction going on. Um, the, the plant was locally known, but the contractor that did all the work was a company called Chilvers. Uh, Chivers. And so the plant was, the plant was actually known as the jam factory by local. But Harwell got going. They, John Cockcroft went and did the rounds of all of the wartime research establishments to bring people in. They built their first reactor at Harwell in 1946, went critical a year later. As an aside, this reactor should have been kept as a national monument. It was used for many, many years as the reference source for calibrating equipment, but sadly, it is all gone. One of the problems, though, uh, was that a lot of the fundamental research on uh, atomic energy uh, wasn't shared by the US uh, back with us. So things like decay times and, and um, just the, the physics of atomic energy was uh, pretty well unknown in this country. So a lot of fundamental research had to take, pl had to take place. The only equipment or tools available to the hundreds of maths graduates that um, Harwell employed were electromechanical calculators, the facets and the Brunswickers, which were quite great. Recommend uh, we all recognize and printed tables, printed tables from the um, American Mathematics Project. And these are huge volumes of solutions of things like differential equations. They were quite expensive and very limited. An awful lot of the work was just hand calculations that went on and on for ages with all the usual problems. So a solution was really required. John Cockcroft uh, was, in a sense, embarrassed about employing all of these bright young maths graduates, giving them pretty mundane and boring jobs. But a chance conversation between the theoretical physics group on one of the electronics groups, literally over the garden fence, thought, well, actually, we could probably make a machine to do this. Our three designers, Ted Cookie Arbor, Dick Barnes, and Gurney Thomas, had actually been over to Cambridge uh, to see the EDSAC machine running. They were fairly, Ted Cookie Arbor, Dick Barnes had both come from uh, Malvern and had been working um, in wartime research. They were pretty switched on chaps at the time. Dick Barnes particularly had developed a lot of the chain home, the calculator, the electromechanical calculator using the chain home system. So the first job they have to do is then actually to make a case to the head of atomic energy research establishment, Ron Cockroft, and his head of theoretical physics, Klaus Fuchs. We'll come back to Mr. Fuchs shortly. The Proposal um, typically went that, that the, uh, our three engineers would turn up to John Cockroft, present their plans. They would expect a really vigorous discussion to actually share all of this information. What actually happened on the day was that neither John Cockroft nor Clarence Fuchs seemed particularly interested. And eventually, John Cockroft called the meeting to an end and said, Yes, it, it sounds like a good idea. Why don't you just go on and get on and do it? Putting all the dates together afterwards, done at the time, it was that morning that Sir John Cockcroft had been told that Klaus Fuchs was a Russian spy. And Klaus Fuchs then was facing pretty well immediate imprisonment afterwards. So you can imagine that the, um, they weren't particularly interested in the design of this machine. This is one of the only photographs of the machine um, when it was at Harwell. It's almost like the machine's passport photo. Um, just, I'm going to just move my window of all the people out slightly, a moment. Uh, let's move that, I'll go back a page. 
It's an electromechanical computer. All of the logic, the program control and so on, are, is relay based. So behind all of those semicircular covers you can see there are banks of relays. Um, the store used Decatron tubes. We'll come on to Decatron tubes in a moment. But the design was completed in uh, early 50 and was built at Carvel itself. With just two, just enough stores, just enough memory to actually use the machine, it was completed in 1951. And was put to use immediately. It was never designed to be a fast computer. That wasn't a particular requirement. What was a requirement is the production of tables. Uh, I mentioned earlier these tables from the WPA project in the States. These listings of solutions to equations. This machine was designed to do just that. So it would run very slowly. Uh, and in fact, a multiplication could take 18 seconds in the worst case. But it was incredibly reliable. Um, so reliable, in fact, actually, it was run continuously. It got moved out of the research department at Harwell into the abandoned old um, aircraft control tower that um, RAF Harwell had left behind. So it could be left to run continuously. The machine was incredibly successful, in a sense, actually. It, um, it worked from day one. They added the rest of the stores fairly quickly. And the maths department set down to actually program the machine. The reliability partly was because the jobs for the computer were prepared on paper tape. There was a problem the program uh, that would normally cause a crash, for instance, these days, the computer would actually reset itself automatically and carry on for the next job for the, uh, from the paper tape. So it was quite possible, and indeed it's done, that, that the actual machine would set up with data to run, and in one particular case, it was over Christmas and the new year. And when they came back after a fortnight's break, the machine is still actually running. Now, there is a sort of slightly apocryphal story that um, Bart Fossey, who was one of the senior mathematicians at um, Harwell, sat down with the machine and attempted a race with the machine. Now, this is Jack Howlett telling the story. And Bart Fossey kept up for about half an hour, um, running at the same speed of the computer. It gives you an idea of how the computer is. For the computer, um, Bart actually apparently retired after half an hour exhausted, but the machine just plowed on. So the machine was actually, I think loved is almost too much of a word. They were very, very proud of this computer. Uh, it was doing a fantastic job and was used to all continuously. Now, Ted Cookyabra was actually sort of Admitted this was a slow computer, and, and the comment here, a slow computer can only justify its existence and is capable of running at long periods unattended. And running 55% of the total time available was actually pretty spectacular when you compare it with, say, equivalent machines that might run for an hour or two before, let's say, a valve died and so on. Ed Cookiabra was slightly cagey. There's a comment there in brackets saying omitting a five week pause to damage, uh, due to damage. We'll see some um, pictures of Ted Cookiabra, but it was only really in the last few years that Ted Cookiabra actually admitted the machine was damaged because he leant against it and knocked one of the store units to the ground, breaking up the actual store. Um, everybody else on the team apparently was absolutely thankful that it wasn't them that had done it, but as long as it was the boss that had done it, it was okay. So it was used, um, that's, that's the first year of running uh, of the machine. Of course, by 1957, um, Harwell have actually moved on. They built a, one of the first transistorized computers. They were buying commercial machines like PTM 555 and Ferranti Mercury. 
And of course, they had access to their colleagues down at AWRE who had things like an IBM Stray and an Atlas. But it was decided not to dismantle the machine. And in particular, a chap called John Hammersley, who was working at Harwell at the time, put together a competition, competition for um, further education colleges and universities that might put together a bid to take over this machine. I haven't got the quote with me here. John Hammersley was pretty sort of disappointed in the way mathematics was being taught in schools. One of his papers was it, um, referred to the soft intellectual trash being taught uh, to school children. But the competition was put together, uh, organized by the Oxford Mathematical Institute. They received over 30 submissions um, from further education colleges, schools, and universities, of which Harwell produced a short, and Oxford Mathematical Institute produced a short list of nine. Now, the nine contenders were then asked to actually visit Harwell to see the machine and put their case to John Cockrell. Um, Several of the teams actually arrived to meet with the Lord Mayor or the Mayor with chains of office and councillors and so on. So this was, it was quite an event over a few days. But I'm pleased to say that the winners were the Wolverhampton and Staffordshire College of Technology. Now, one of the lecturers at Wolverhampton uh, was Chapel Cecil Ramsbottom. Cecil Ramsbottom was adamant to keep this information, keep this, this machine in the news and keep, keep promoting the college. And this has been so useful to us because the number of press articles and, and papers produced is really a result of Cecil Ramsbottom's work. They were very proud of ourselves. Um, they made the quote, they actually had received support to physically get the machine. So to the plan was that the machine would be available for hire to industry and commerce in the Midlands. <clears throat> I suspect they had a fairly um, vague idea of what the computer would do. There was a comment again in one of the press articles, it can for instance, work out wage calculations much more quickly than human beings. Sadly, that's absolutely not true. Any bookkeeper could run through a payroll much faster than our machine. Um, and of course, the only um, the comparable commercial computers were simply unaffordable for colleges like Wolverhampton. Um, that's, that was in March 9, 8, 1957. They didn't receive any help from um, Harwell. Harwell um, sent them off with all of the manuals, spare parts, fault finding guides, but really did, couldn't spare the time. So actually Wolverhampton did really quite a good job. It took them three or four months and reassembled the machine and got the machine working again, which is, which is pretty spectacular. And at that point, the machine gets renamed. It gets a name uh, called the Witch Computer. It's a bit um, torturous, but Wolverhampton Instrument for Teaching Computing from Harwell. Uh, and again, there are more press coverage there that, that, sell, um, that Cecil Ramsbottom put together. But it did enable the actual college to start that first, uh, first undergraduate course in computer technology in 65. One of the things about having the machine back on display is, of course, we actually meet people that use the machine at Wolverhampton. I think we have a few people in the audience tonight. We also, um, as a visitor to the museum, Eight members of that undergraduate computer course first year came to the museum to see it. They were all snapped up really by IBM. So these guys, when they were coming back to us, ladies and gentlemen came back to us, were all about to retire from IBM. So I think it really gave them a very good start. But as well as actually teaching at the college, it was used um, for night school classes. Um, and for local grammar schools to bring students in. And it was used quite extensively for that. And I think, um, I think Suzanne in the audience who might be here from later actually is one of those students. It would be quite ironic if it was her picture. But again, these are more pictures of the machine at 
Wolverhampton. <clears throat> Wolverhampton, after its 10 years of use, organized what was called the Witches Anniversary Lunch and actually bought the buyers back from um, Harwell to actually see the machine working. And I think that must have been really quite a special occasion, actually. The, the Harwell, a lot of Harwell chaps had moved on to other things. Go back and see this working must have been quite fantastic. Uh, Wolverhampton had an ex post office engineer, which at the time is extremely useful because ex post office engineers that were used to using strategy equipment know how to maintain relays and the contacts. So the machine was kept working all of this time. It's spectacular. Key picture, and in fact, one of the most famous pictures of the machine uh, was this one that was published again in the Wolverhampton Press and Star. And this is uh, a student at the time on the left, Peter Burden, uh, and one of the masters from the college, Frank Hawley, on the right. Peter Burden uh, was a just waiting to go up to Cambridge to read maths, um, but had been using the computer. Uh, while he was at school and went in over the summer vacation before going up to Cambridge to effectively honour one of those promises to local industry. The local industry was Chubb, the lock maker. One of the problems apparently in designing locks is a certain, uh, to designing the key is that certain patterns are too weak or two of the pins are actually end up too weak. Uh, and are difficult to manufacture or, or, or won't last in practice. So the guys actually set about programming this. Now this pro this this picture is a, a tad contrived. Um, Peter Burden sadly passed away last year. That it looks as if we're both looking to try and establish whether there are holes in the paper tape. But um, it's it's an absolute wonderful picture. One of the things that um, we'll come on to actually, if I look. I look at the code of the computer. I'm going to go back one. One of the problems um, with paper tape, uh, as the machine used electromechanical paper tape readers. So these are pins that are going to push up through the tape. Now, Harwell, with its slightly grander budget, was able to use mylar for the tape. So they would last. Wolverhampton couldn't afford mylar. What they would tend to do is punch the same routine multiple times around the tape. Now, Frank and Peter here are holding an actual loop of tape. So what they would have done with that is program a routine. Let's say it's a, let's say it's a routine which calculates square root. They would program that probably 20 or 30 times on the, on the paper tape. Trail the paper tape around light fittings in the room. So while this program was running, and the, the Chub Key program, program took 10 days to run, they wouldn't actually wear through the paper tape. By the time uh, 1973, uh, Wolverhampton by that stage had acquired an ICL 1900 machine. So the Harwell machine, or which, as it was known at that stage, had gone into semi-retirement. It's still being used occasionally. Cecil Ramsbottom, bless him, uh, arranged a whole day for the retirement of the witch. And as another piece from the Express and Star, which the computer earns part retirement. Apparently, the IBM machine that had also got played a tune, and the ICL 1900 produced the artwork, which we'd love to have actually seen, the line printer. But the other thing that Cecil Ramsbottom did then is had the machine listed in the Guinness Book of Records in 1973 as the world's most durable computer. Now we'll come back to that, that particular story um, shortly. So 1973, uh, the second retirement. And again, it was important. Nobody wanted the machine to be broken down or dismantled. It was actually transferred to Birmingham Science Museum. 
Now, I suspect some of the audience will recognise that, the old original Birmingham Science Museum, which was absolutely fantastic. I spent every, every Saturday there from, I, I grew up in Birmingham, I spent every Saturday there from oh, my sort of 12 year old to about 17 or so. Uh, it was an incredible, uh, the, the, that's just the front of the actual Science Museum. It, 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 it followed the line of the canal down there and it was absolute treasure trove. So the machine was put on display, um, I think, and my mother assumed, my mother guarantees this was me as a 12 year old at Birmingham Science Museum, actually in front of one of the engines. So let's go back. The machine was put on display um, and with the intention, and I think it was Chuckle Mike Constable at Birmingham at the time, the intention was always to have the machine working at that point. And in fact, the, the museum wrote to Harwell to see if Harwell could actually sort of offer some advice or help get the machine working. I don't think it was ever worked, if, uh, worked there. If anyone remembers the Science Museum, it you initially was upstairs behind the whole, this huge way Magnox reactor where the fox and geese machine was, and then later moved downstairs. Now in 1997, of course, with this sort of, this, the sort of the closure of the, of the Science Museum, it was then actually moved into story again. A lot of the machines from uh, the Science Museum from New Hall Street went into the museum's collection center at Charlotte Street. Now this was a picture that one of my colleagues took, and this is zoomed in quite a lot. Um, he was actually at the collection center looking at a completely different machine, but managed to take some pictures of what was in packing cases and storage boxes and so on. Didn't particularly recognize this machine. And it wasn't until, where are we? Talking about 10 years ago now, I was going through these pictures looking for something else completely different. I found this picture and thought, hang on, I recognize that control panel. And you can just see the black control panel with the switch with the whites and uh, white and red switches on it in the distance. I recognize that control panel. That's the witch. We then paid a visit to Birmingham Museum's super new collection center, which is down near Vauxhall Power Station. That's a fantastic facility. And we were faced with this obstacle course. If you look right in the back, in the distance is um, the Harwell machine or part of the Harwell machine. We had to move absolutely everything else out of the way. This is an Orion computer in front of us. Uh, we moved everything else out of the way and actually found pretty well all of the components of the machine. It had been assembled from the Science Museum not terribly well. A lot of the racks had been cut apart, but it was everything seemed to be there. One of the wonderful things about museums is they don't tend to lose anything. They can never find it, but they certainly haven't lost it. So we, we spent a long time at the museum, found all the components as well. And it looked at that point as if there was a possibility that actually the machine could be put together by, again and restored, restored work, working order. One of the issues, of course, is if you're going to start a restoration project like this, is have we found all or sufficient of the hardware? Do we have any access to the manuals, the diagrams, circuit diagrams and operation guides? Even are the original, at this point, are the original designers or users or programmers of the machine still around that might be able to help? And the biggest question, do we have everything we need to restore the machine? Do we have the people, the people with the skills and the time, finance potentially, and space, space is particularly important. And to what end do you go to restore the machine? What is the eventual plan to actually uh, do with the machine? And should we attempt the project? Now, there's quite a lot of thought in this as well. And with the help of the Computer Conservation Society, you have a huge amount of expertise in this. 
digitising in fact, yes, it would be a worthy project. One of the things we did find on a subsequent visit to Birmingham was this box of spares. Now this came from, we had to hire a forklift truck. Back one of our chaps to the front of the forklift truck, drive up and down and up and down these racks in the storage centre looking for anything likely. And we found this box. Now this has uh, spares for the machine. This is the top layer of the box. There are some test paper tapes to the top right hand side, valves, but importantly, which we didn't realize is when we lifted these front two boxes out, the complete circuit diagrams and theory of operation of the machine was in the bottom of the box, which was just absolutely unbelievable. So there are spare, everything from spare ribbons and software, tools to maintain the relays, the theory of operation, which Harwell had produced at the time, which beautifully produced and, and incredibly detailed. And we would have had a huge problem with that, that the guide. The other thing, courtesy of the British Computer Society and the Computer Conservation Society, we were actually put in touch with the designers of the machine. Now, the, the, the slightly frail looking chap sitting down uh, is Ted Cookie and this was a, at his home in um, uh, Abingdon. And the chap standing up looking over, looking slightly quizzical, is Dick Barnes, one of the designers. They had kept, both of them, kept scrapbooks of what had happened to the machine. And they kept all the paperwork from Wolverhampton and so on. So one of the one of the, the first parts of this meeting, and I think there's a picture of me looking at, uh, at my scrapbook, comparing with Dick Barnes. They were absolutely overjoyed that this machine would be uh, acknowledged and was likely to be restored. And both Ted and Dick were extremely helpful. So that was in 2009. So by that stage, we decided, in fact, that if I had a case to actually restore the machine. We made the proposal to the Computer Conservation Society initially, and then put our proposal to the Birmingham Museum's Collection Centre. Now, there's obviously there's a, a worry here as well. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a tension between a museum curator that does his absolute best to preserve the machine and see that no harm or change comes to it, and a group of enthusiastic computer engineers who want to get the machine working again. But we persuaded that the um, <clears throat> Birmingham City Council eventually, and the Museum's Collection Centre, that we would actually be able to do this. And the machine was actually transported, the machine, 3rd of September in 2009. Some of the restoration project itself, the machine um, had suffered over the years. And although, Wolverhampton had done their absolute best to keep the machine working. There was quite a lot of damage um, needed repairs. The usual problems of rubber covered cables and so on. Um, these cables on the left look like they've hit the wrong end of a hot soldering iron, I think is what I was going to understand. Mostly the machine was just absolutely filthy. Um, some of the rubber covered wiring needed to be changed. Now, generally what's happened in the whole restoration process is the wiring itself would be left in place and the new wiring put in parallel. Nothing has been re removed from the machine. So all of the original components are still there. The connections between the various racks had suffered because of the joints and um, uh, bad joints, broken wires, but actually it worked really quite well. A lot of the components, bear in mind the age of components of resistors and components that were purchased in the late 40s, had changed values over the years. So that took quite a lot of um, investigation. Decatron tube themselves, the asphalt tube, actually seem to be have an incredible life. They, they there's, there's very little you can do with a decatron tube to damage. 
So all the stores actually worked perfectly. We didn't know how to program it either. So there was a quite a learning curve uh, of us learning how to program the computer. I'm conscious I've got 10 minutes, yes. Um, when the machine was restored to working order, we arranged a meeting again to bring the designers back into the museum uh, and the users working left to right here. We have Peter Burden from Wolverhampton. Peter, I mentioned, uh, was waiting to go to Cambridge and he did, off, he did go to Cambridge and read maths. And I'm not sure the combination of good fortune or bad fortune and himself back teaching at Wolverhampton College, uh, Wolverhampton Staffordshire college and actually using the machine again in lesson uh, that's peter burden next to him is bart fossey the senior mathematician from harwell the chap that had actually set uh the race against the machine me in the middle dick barnes and ted cookie ted cookie at the time um was becoming increasingly frail uh his family bought him uh, along for the day his son said to me, Ted would have crawled over hot cold to get to the museum that day to see the museum working. Sadly, he, he passed away not long afterwards, but this was a, a, a literally a fantastic day. It's worth having a look at YouTube for the video of the machine. If you search for Harwell Reboot, you'll find that. One of, those, one of those peculiar videos that suddenly goes viral with over a thousand hits just over that weekend. Quite incredible. Bart Fossey was very kind and actually agreed to redo the race. So Bart Fossey sat down with a calculator, um, a Brunswiger, and actually sort of ran the race against the machine as well, which I think is incredibly good sport of him. The machine itself. Now, a slightly better picture, is used absolutely every day. Uh, oh, hang on, we're in COVID, aren't we? Was, before this, was used absolutely every single day. Uh, school parties visit the museum pretty well every day, um, and hopefully we'll really start so shortly. It is a perfect museum, perfect machine, the demonstrating computer. It's slow, so you're actually able to see what's going on. And the fact that the Decatron tubes show the exact value in each of them, it means that we can actually go up to the machine and point out and say, yeah, we can see that this store contains one and this store contains two. So we'll program an operation, uh, uh, an addition instruction, put the value in there, and actually follow the steps perfectly. Um, and that's been really, what about school children? School children like to see things working. They also like the hint of, uh, a slight hint of danger as well. So this machine is humming, it's one and a half tons, it's about 12 feet from side to side and about eight feet tall. So there's a certain amount of excitement and danger when the machine's running. Um, but it runs absolutely perfectly. We can single step through the code, uh, we have students that actually have prepared, we send out a, a pack of information to students beforehand with the order code and some sample programs. And we've had students arrive that punch their program actually while they're at, um, at the museum and we run the code on the computer. In terms of maintenance, actually, I think Decatron tubes would be pretty well foolproof. Relays. Again, as long as the, the, you have some handy ex engineers that can actually trim and line up all the contacts on relays, they're very reliable. Some of the components, some of the resistors and things have actually changed value, uh, capacitors as well, which puts them slightly out of um, the spec for what they're required in the machine. So again, typically, the original capacitor or resistor was left in place and there's a substitute um, doing the job alongside. Same with the power supply. The power supply looks absolutely identical, uh, but some of the um, 
there are a lot of extra additional facilities in the power supply to monitor exactly what's going on. We don't rely on a fuse going or, or somebody noticing the smoke running in the back. There's a whole variety of Arduinos and sensors around the back of the machine, checking that everything is actually behaving itself and is still happy. I've sort of accelerated through, through this fairly quickly. There's a couple of slides that I did want to show you. Um, first of all, though, a quick look at Harwell Decatron. There's a lot of information on YouTube about the machine. Um, Harwell Decatron for the volume, 1 million hits as well. That is really quite um, a, a special video. It's, it's worth seeing that. What I did want to show you, and I, I've taken it out of the slides, you're going to have to forgive me. I'm just going to go and find this particular slide that I would like to show you. Um, and it's these. I'm going to unhide that, unhide that one, and go that one. These are the paper tape readers. Um, that could be, and it looks a tad short, a subroutine. There are seven paper tape readers in the machine. So typically what you do is have the control program on one paper tape reader, and then calling out to different paper tape readers to do a subroutine. So let, let's imagine this, this loop of tape did a, um, it's not long enough for a square root, but let's imagine it did a square root. You could actually put the value you're expected to uh, calculate in the accumulator, and then under program control, switch out to this tape reader, which would then actually read in that program from the loop of paper tape, form the operation to do the square root, and then transfer control back to the um, other paper tape reader with the control program on. Now, these are the electromechanical tape readers I talked about, which are would actually wear through that tape fairly quickly. But you can imagine with a little bit of thought, I and mean, if I go back to the sort of typical program for the, some of the programmers in the audience, with seven tape, to tape, tape readers, one reader declared as the control program, and then up to sort of six subroutines that you could build in. This is really quite a sophisticated machine. The, and usually it has hardware multiply and divide built in, um, but for its time, I think it was really quite a, 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 an incredible design actually as well. Easy to program, easy to fault find, and with a single step facility, stepping through code, so one press of the button would read one instruction from the paper tape. We can actually follow the, 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 the machine working. It, it's a beautiful machine to actually demonstrate and to show people using the machine, uh, using the computer and programming the computer. Now I seem to. I, I, I'm conscious of the fact I rushed. Through, I rushed through. I was given 45 minutes, and that's exactly 45 minutes about the machine. But I think we've got quite a few people in the audience as well that actually can add to the story. Um, John, great. Right. Okay, Kevin, absolutely brilliant. I was totally, <laughs> totally uh, oblivious to the time. A wonderful talk. If anyone's got questions please do one of two things. Either put use the raise hand function and I will turn you on as quickly as I can do. Or if you don't want to speak, um, please um, basically use the chat function and I will get to you as quickly as I can do. All right. Okay. Um, uh, Mike Ted has got a question. I'm just going to allow you to talk and I want to promote you to uh, panelist Mike. See? Yeah. Ted, Mike, the mic, the floor's yours. You can see, can you see me? Yeah, I can't. You're just coming um, in now. Oh, we can yeah. hear you. Yeah, we can hear you, that's the important thing. Yeah. Um, uh, this famous um, uh, program uh, done for Chubbs, I can add a, a little bit uh, with that. Oh, uh, right. The, the program was actually written by uh, Peter Burden and myself, the two of us. Yeah. Um, uh, we, we were both on our way to Cambridge and the school, 
would have wanted to keep us on the books until the day when, when they got their money for the, how many students they had. Um, and uh, something's wrong here. Yeah. Uh, and um, so um, we, we, we spent quite a bit of time when, because we'd finished uh, school, but were still at school, uh, up at Wolverhampton working on, on this program. Yeah. And it's uh, um, the bit, there was a tremendous pleasure for me one day when, when I um, moved to, to Aberystwyth as a lecturer in 1972. And uh, when I got there, I was given a key to the front of the building where my office was. And it was a key to the lock that we had designed for Chubbs. Uh, so we, I mean, it, it was a great pleasure to have done a really useful programme on this computer. Yeah. I think I, it was, was it Commonwealth Week as well, I think, wasn't it? That again. I think it was Commonwealth Week as well, I think, wasn't it, really? The, 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 the college wanted to actually get lots of publicity. Oh, uh, well, yeah. I mean, there was a, uh, an article in the, the, the local Express and Star uh, uh, and starting off saying that you wouldn't expect schoolboys to be able to program a computer. <laughs> and of course, my six year old grandson does these days. Um, but um, uh, Kevin mentioned the, 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 the facility it had of single step. Uh, and uh, that together with one's ability to read the stores, you became very expert at that after a while. Um, the, the, this meant that um, you could debug programs very easily, um, thanks to the, these facilities. Um, and uh, another thing I would say, uh, it was mentioned about the paper tapes wearing out, it was my introduction to algor algorithm analysis, because you had to work out ex roughly how many times a particular piece of code would be used. <laughs> and that then uh, gave you the guide as to uh, how many copies you had to have on the loop, which incidentally went round nails on the wall and all sorts of things. Um, the very central loops we, we did use Mylar for, but uh, that, 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 uh, we didn't have much Mylar. It was expensive, as you mentioned. That is fantastic, Mike. I thank you very much for taking part. Um, so I take it that you didn't you didn't um, go back to Wolverhampton after the game. No, no, I I I became a mathematician uh, until eventually I decided that maybe I should go back to computing um, and uh, and worked in industry and then went went to Aberystwyth where I stayed for the rest of my working career. Thank you. Okay. Um, Susan, I, I promise I'd let you come in at this point. Do you do you yes, have any questions you'd like to add into it? Well, yes, there's several things. Um, I was just a schoolgirl in 1964, 65, when I went to night school at Wolverhampton Tech, as it was then, yeah. and did my course on the Witch computer. Uh, would that be Fortran 4, I think? And I just thought it was absolutely amazing. And I often give lectures about how I um, programmed this computer and I would spend hours putting in, was it Fortran 4? Two well, guys, you, I think it was Fortran on their ICL machine, but yeah. Yeah, yeah two, yeah, whatever, a, a simple equation. And then I would get the result out there. It was absolutely amazing. I have to say I'm I'm quite uh, quite disappointed that these days um, uh, it seems to still be uh, mainly the boys who are doing the the programming, and I think us girls are just as good. But yes, uh, but I I programmed uh, the witch computer in 1964 1965, and it was absolutely wonderful. I went up there for night school every week and at the end I, you know, you like uh, did a full time program X plus Y equals Z and when the result came out you thought it was wonderful. <laughs> I think the, the machine was, was, it's not an exaggeration, the machine was loved. Um, I think people have told me that at night um, you could actually see the machine through the windows of the college up uh, in, in, in its yeah. lab. Um, and people were fascinated by it from that point of view. Uh, 
That's quite wonderful. Thank you, Susan. Um, okay, good. We've, we've had two questions in on chat. Oh. Um, Jonathan, I'll unmute you if you like. Um, it's asking about the accuracy of the machine. Obviously, you've got uh, both, you're both doing integer and floating point ar arithmetic on this. Um, what, was, what was the accuracy of it? Ah, right. It's fixed point. Um, so all numbers are, I'm just trying to actually find. Numbers are, hang on a minute. The other trick is write a book. Write a book because then you can then forget everything and then go and look at the uh, book again. One second. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Seven. It's fixed decimal point. So the numbers it could store are from minus nine point. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven decimal points. So minus nine point nine sevens up to plus 9.97. So, uh, yes, and then programmed in, by, in, in decimal as well. Okay. Jonathan, I'll turn you in. I'll put you on where I can find you again on the list. <laughs> so you can come back on that one. We, we, we have another question as well in, um, and I'm going to get this name wrong, Sahul Rana. Um, <coughs> you mentioned that the Guinness Book of Records in 1973. Could you elaborate on this? Didn't come back to that, yes. Cecil Robinson, uh, Cecil Ramsbottom, who uh, promoted the machine so, so well, uh, obviously had it listed. We, when the machine was restored and we held the reboot event, I went back to the Guinness Book of Records. Um, that's a very different operation these days from what it was. Um, but eventually we, we managed to track the right people down and actually had the machine re-evaluated as still the world's most durable computer. And in 1990, let me just find the date, 1990, can't find it. They actually issued another certificate for us. So it's actually on the wall next to the computer. Still the world's oldest working digital computer. Um, okay. Um, Dan, you wanted to come in. You've got to quit your hand up for a question. Do you want to, you should yeah, be able to speak. Yeah, hopefully people can hear me. Um, I was just going to enlarge a bit on, on the New Commons Society's involvement in this, of course, because Mike Constable, who worked at the collection center, uh, was actually chairman of the Midlands region of the New right. Commons Society yeah. um, and uh, is still an active member of, of the society. And of course, between me and him and Kevin, um, how do I put this? We, I think, managed to persuade Birmingham that they should let the, let the machine go and be restored. Well, they, and in fact, actually, we, we've since been back to Birmingham because there's another machine that they had in storage called the Heck One. Um, yeah. which is a machine that um, BTM produced. And they were happy. They said, sort of, yeah, yeah, absolutely take it, put it on display, restore it, and so on. We had a visit back from the museum. They came down to see what we'd done with the Heck One and were extremely disappointed that we decided, in fact, it wasn't a candidate to be restored. Literally too much missing and too much, too much damage as well. So there is... Um, there are several machines still in uh, Birmingham, which we would, I'd like to get their hands on. That huge Ferranti um, Orion machine would be a candidate. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Do we, does anybody else wish to come in at this point? We've, um, looking at the chats. Uh, looking for chat, I'm looking for the chats here, yeah. What, what, what is the operating voltage of this? Is, is it a, a full mains voltage or higher than mains, or is it, it can't be a reduced voltage? Well, well um, the, um, all the relay controls are, in fact, if I find a picture, you will Hang on. find a good picture of it. Let's get rid of that. No, let's keep going. Keep going, Kevin. One second. Bop, 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 bop. There. 
all the relays are all 50 volts DC. They're all post up style re relays. So there's a 50 volt DC power supply for the whole thing. And, and then the mains voltage on the Decatrons, and I'm not an engineer, so I'm just checking with my colleagues, it's around 120 volts. Okay. So it's it's a so basically for it's a relatively low voltage. I I, I was hoping. Yeah, that I mean the whole compact, the whole thing's only one and a half kilowatts. The whole thing, yeah, yeah. including all the paper tape readers and the printers. Yeah. So so yeah, I, I was actually we we um, we had somebody who said they were coming to the talk um, who actually worked at on the actual manufacturing and testing side of the Decatron true tubes when he was younger. And I can't see him in the audience. So John, if you're there, um, if you want to, to contribute, please do, do come in at this point. Um, Andrew as well, um, you've just put your hand up. Do you want to ask your question, please? Yeah, yes, Kevin. Uh, I was somebody else who used to haunt the Birmingham Museum in my case, <laughs> 58 to 64, which was before this. Um, behind the fox and geese machine, there was a large demonstration panel which had lots of Decatron tubes in it. That was uh, this. Do you know anything about that, please? Yeah, that was part of this machine. I I remember I remember the fox and goose machine, um, and the Harwell machine was up. Not all of it was up upstairs. This was upstairs behind the big Magnox. That's away. Um, I think that that was there. There was another couple of machines there as well, weren't there? Uh, but part of it was actually there as well. I, um, I, Birmingham Museums. I mean, don't let me get started on the think tank. It was, uh, mm. But Birmingham Museum collection. Please, please don't start on think tank. We have good relationships with think tank. We want to keep them that way. <laughs> the, the old. It was fantastic. Everywhere you turned was another. I mean. Just silly things like there's a, a one room with just a collection of musical boxes and and uh, which is an amazing, um, fantastic space. And I believe I I I, I don't do the Birmingham anymore that the building is still there and still empty. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Conscious of time. Kevin, yep. that was absolutely wonderful. Um, now all we now need to do is organise a day trip to come along and see you all. Yes. <laughs> and, 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 I'll have a, and I'll have a play with this machine. Yeah. All I can say on behalf of everyone is thank you. It's wonderful that machines like this have survived um, and that more than that they've survived and that the effort has been made to keep them going because with it is only through simplifying modern technology so that people can see it in this way that you can actually it is much easier to sell what is going on and explain what is going on in a modern machine with something like this than it ever is on any other method at all and so from a point of from an educational engagement point of view and seeing a pile of flashing lights like that is nothing better than engaging a, you know um, a a pile of school kids and everything else like this into there it, it, it's absolutely wonderful everyone all i would ask you to do is could we please thank kevin in our usual way and basically thank you all thank you all very much for coming and i hope to see as many of you again as possible on the 16th of march thank you all chaps ladies and gentlemen here we are. Okay, everyone. I hope you all enjoyed that. It, it's gone well. Um, hang on, we've got a couple of no major chats, no major coming in. If anyone wants to continue the conversation afterwards, very, very happy now to um, to unmute the last one or two of you. Uh, if you want to speak and have a chat, there's absolutely no problems. Uh, you know, please feel free to contribute as much or as little as you want towards it. Um, or if you've got any questions about what we're going to be doing as a society going forward, again, just please ask and I'll try to explain. As, as quick aside, it, it's interesting what you're saying about teaching. Uh, we've had certain schools that come uh, to the museum and say, well, one of the uh, parts of A-level computing is to teach some assembly language or some machine code. And we've been trying to do that with um, Microsoft, whatever it is these days, and Pentium Pros and so on. 
I just got to, I, I, I didn't bear thinking of that. It's just too awful to, to do that. Whereas this machine, the other thing we use as well, a lot of the museum is PDP 8 for pretty well the same reason. Because it's simple order code, we can get across everything you need to understand in terms of uh, assembly language without worrying about which addressing mode you're in on a Pentium something or other. Yeah. Yes. I, I had one, one uh, I'd say bad experience with a, a PDP-8. That's why we, it was swapped for the appeal. When I was doing when I was doing my uh, my, my doctorate at Sheffield, um, in the lab we had a we had a very very big uh, testing machine for testing concrete beams. Um, one of the um, one of one of the the final years was uh, doing his final um, testing. He built this lovely concrete pre-stressed concrete beam and was testing it. Um, unfortunately, we'd got the programming of the PDP-8 wrong. Instead of applying the load gradually, it just hit it. <laughs> <laughs> we, it cost us a lot of beer that day. <laughs> I take it the PDP eight survived. That's important. Thing. Yeah, I don't think I don't think the students survived. I don't think his nerves survived <laughs> after that. Yeah, so it was possible to get them wrong, but that was the, it was fun. But um, no, it's there. Um, Susan, I'll, I'll give you one. Um, you you made one comment, which on if you're still here, uh, are you? She left us. Oh, she thinks she's left us. But never mind. No, it it. Um, it, it seems that um, although she was commenting that it is still a boys game for this, um, I know that certainly in the research establishments in the States, they very much prefer female programmers. They are seen as being a lot more careful and it's surprising that many of the major projects that are being run by females, it's not just as the programmers, they're at yeah. all levels now. There was a period, it's that period where the late seventies, uh, where home computers started to appear, particularly as kits. And the people that tended to build them were the guys, probably like some of many of us, that had previously been building hi-fi systems and building radios and things like that. And they became boys' toys for too long. That, that, I think that's the problem. I, I, if I'm still uh, yeah, allowed, yeah. Um, I think it mainly happened in schools where boys were, were just assertive when it came to equipment and they, and they pushed the girls away. But certainly when I was employing programmers in, in industry, um, I would uh, probably um, discriminate in favour of the ladies because, uh, as you said, I mean, they, they would be very thorough, um, very reliable. Um, they, they, they didn't come in drunk, uh, well, with a hangover the next day. Um, and it's, 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 it's certainly a great pity that um, so few uh, girls take up uh, computing, but maybe uh, it'll change uh, when they realise what a good career it is. It is getting better. It's only been the last few years that people have actually acknowledged the fact that this is a problem. So it is getting better. I mean, I remember when I, how old am I? I'm 60. Um, when I started in 20, my, my first two bosses in computing were both women, and it was perfectly reasonable yeah. now when i own my own business i try and employ new programmers never ever get any women girls to apply but, both, both, my, both my daughters are systems analysts well one's a systems analyst programmer the other one is a a, a programmer of um she had the computer she's using has currently got a thousand cores on it <laughs> Yes. Uh, very, very specialist programming. But both of them say exactly this. Both of them have worked for uh, senior female programmers they, they, and they find it very, very good. Although having said that, it's, the, there is a very, there is a subtly different atmosphere in America to the UK as to how these things are handled. Mm. But, um, mm, yes, <laughs> but it's an awful lot there. Um, Ivy, you've, um, you wanted to come in on, on, on a comment? Yes, just a comment. Um, it's interesting because I, um, when I left school in 1967, I went to work for six months before I went to university at a firm called Airmec, Airmec AEI they became, um, in High Wycombe. And we were doing, uh, it was, it made machine tool control systems, point to point systems for drilling machines. And uh, in the latter days, it was doing sort of uh, contour drilling and milling machines. And of course that originally was all relays. As I was there, they were starting to move to DTL logic, but it was all relays and it was actually fantastic as a sort of 
a teenager before he'd actually gone to, to university to see the way the way you debugged it. And I remember one engineer coming in one day, we had an arrow contactor and he said, I found it. We've been looking for this for three or four weeks as to why this machine just keeps stopping and going wrong. And he held it up and he got the, the two contacts, the two magnetic contacts from the dismantled contactor. And they were held together even where there was no um, current going through them. Yeah. And it was because there was something just across the surface that was sticking them together. <laughs> it was, but it really was, um, you know, I, I later worked in the computer industry and debugging them was, was slightly um, hairy sometimes, but this was just really sort of mechanical engineering rather than electronic engineering. So looking at that machine, I'm thinking, oh, that looks sort of familiar, even though it isn't the same. Mm. So I was just a comment really. So yeah, mm. thank you. That thank you. That's so, I've seen I've seen the reports in the Computer Conservation Society about um, you know the work restoring that and running it. And so it's it's good to see you and and uh, thank you for the work yeah. you've done on it. Yeah. It's I mean one of the problems is it's become become such a big story. I mean I didn't cover things like the, the uh, oil, an oil painting was painted of the uh, machine when it was in storage in Birmingham. A portrait of the Dead Witch. Um, and only a couple of years ago, we were contacted by the um, the artists that do, do that. We found the original oil painting, which was on the wall of a cafe in Manchester. Um, and the artist produced a new version of it, a living witch, rather nice, actually. Yeah. Um, and the, but the, the more... And this is this sort of, if you build it, they will come and all the rest of it. Once you have that machine there and you start talking about it, the number of stories that come out is it, just quite incredible. Mm. Um, it was only two or three, two or three months ago, uh, I got a message from a uh, really quite an elderly lady who lives in Vienna, um, who worked at Harwell and was one of the first programmers to actually use the machine. She referred to it as that, oh gosh, she said, that Meccano monstrosity. <laughs> yeah. um, just, sorry, just another another comment. You you showed that picture of the Orion system in uh, and said, "Oh, you'd love to do that." Do you know there's a colleague who I worked with, who I still see occasionally as a as an ex ICL lunch that we have, who worked on the Orion. And uh, I'm sure he would love to see it again as well. Well, um, it, 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 it is, it's, it's, it's time and it's, uh, if, I, if I just go yeah. back to that picture, um, let me just find it because it's there. Yeah, that one, yeah. Um, there's a Bryant disk drive behind it, oh, which yes. you can just see the platters. Yeah. Uh, my God, that would be terrifying. Those huge, <laughs> um, I don't know if you can see my mouse, you can see the head actuators yes. either side. That would be terrifying is, um yeah. there's a that's obviously the orion computer in front of it as well all the orion processor cabinets there there's a punch card computer on this side part of the punch card machine there it's incredible the other thing they've got um which you should all see if you grew up in birmingham they've got the illuminated sign that used to be on the top of the hp source factory in Aston, and that's actually there in the in the um, collection centre. Fantastic, oh. yeah. That so, that disc drive reminds me when I was a student. Uh, when I was uh, first work I went to work at ICL, I went on a course at Manchester. It's given by Tom Kilburn actually. But we <laughs> went and had a look at the last bit of the Atlas machine, and that, that looks very similar to an Atlas disk drive. I, I wouldn't be surprised, actually. I mean, um, you know, things like this were actually brought in. Um, I mean, one of the things we have at the museum is some disk platters, which are just over a metre across. Yeah. Um, so it's always terrific with the kids, um, school kids. Well, how many photographs have you got on your iPhone? They've all got, <laughs> they've all got hundreds, haven't they, really? So it's, well, actually, how many of your pictures would fit on this disc platter? <laughs> you see, works out at about five. <laughs> okay. oh, great. Um, and the other, the other nice trick as well, I think we all probably remember disc packs that weighed a ton that were into top-loading disc drives. Yeah. Yep. 
one of the big lads from the school party, get him to lift it, hold it at arm's length while the rest calculate the capacity and see whether his arm gives up first or they get the sums right first. So, uh, <laughs> uh, it, it, it's, one, it, it's having the, the physical artifacts so important. Yeah. Very well, important. The first disc that I ever came across working in industry uh, was about, it was um, a disc, I should think the diameter must have been about five feet. Um, it was a, a single piece of, of metal, uh, weighed about a hundred weight, spinning vert across a, a horizontal axis, so the disc was vertical. It was spinning at very high speed, and we suddenly started thinking, now what would happen if this thing seized up? If the bearing we, failed. <laughs> we, we, did all, we did all the calculations and moved our desks carefully so that we wouldn't be in the line of fire if it happened. <laughs> I, know, I know a story in the uh, machine room when I was at Kidsgrove where um, one, of the, one of the exchangeable disks, 100, 100 megabyte, Crumsley can't believe it was only 100 megabyte, 100 megabyte exchangeable disk, it got loose on its on its um, mountings as it was still going around. And three of the, op they, the operators just abandoned the room and looked at it through the window to see which way it would go. And it eventually shut itself down, but they they could be dangerous. There's a lot of energy in those. I, I know, I, 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 I think it was the university. I, I, I think I was told this story that a disc had died or a drum had died and it was actually embedded and they left it embedded in the wall of the computer center. Yeah. Possibly a box, but... Uh, yeah. I know. I've, I've seen. I've seen one work not come up, not come off, but work loose when we were at, Sh at Shepherd. Never didn't see it happen. Saw the the, the mess it made afterwards, and uh, it certainly had manked up everything else around the machine, even mm -hmm. though it didn't come off completely. So yes, wouldn't like to have been near it when when a disc came off. <laughs> okay, everyone, have we got any more questions for for Kevin? If not, I I, I will yeah, draw. Just, just one comment. Could could I thank Kevin again? I, I, it was a very nice talk. Thank and you. not just for the talk, for, for uh, the res restoration of this computer, which um, uh, you can imagine bring, brought back tremendous memories for me when I was able to visit the machine uh, in uh, Bletchley um, and see what a wonderful job they'd done. Uh, it, it really was a, a great excitement for me. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Well, thank you, everyone, then. Or, yes. Or have, have, a, have a pleasant evening, and we'll see you, hopefully, most of you on the 16th of March. So we're all going to meet in the pub now. Yeah, that's the only problem. But uh, I suppose it's a beer by ourselves. But it's uh, <laughs> you know. um, cheerio, cheerio, everyone. Bye bye. Okay. Cheerio, everyone. Danny, you got a recording? Do you think? Oh, Dan's gone as well. Okay.